Did you straight away think these alleged comments were racist? Yes, look, uh, the Prime Minister made it very clear at Prime Minister's questions on Wednesday that they were racist. Took him some time um, to do that. Did you think well, straight away well, they were racist? Although you said it, it took an age in political terms, it didn't really take very long at all. The Prime Minister was very clear uh, on Wednesday, and his spokesman had been clear the evening before, that they were racist comments, um, and they were unacceptable. And, and Mr Hesse uh, apologised for those comments. That's not actually what happened initially. It did take some time for Downing Street to say these comments were racist. They were rather... And also him saying that Frank Astor has apologised when all he's done is say specifically that comments were rude. I actually think it's very interesting and very specifically people talk about it as a problem in UK politics. And it is a problem in UK, racism is a big problem in UK politics specifically. But what's interesting is actually among on the ground in the UK, regular people in this country really are not like this at all. Like you've done a really good job at trying to engender anti-racism in this country amongst normal people, normal working class folk that you meet out on the street. It's just our silver spoon elitist private school idiots in our political class who continue with this nonsense. Dancing, dancing around that issue, in fact, until your cabinet colleague, Kemi Badenoch, said online these were clearly racist. That was not what Downing Street was saying on the record. Well, look, I'm sure people wanted to make sure and check the facts. And the you know, newspaper reports things. You do want to go and check the facts are correct. And then I think the Prime Minister was very clear about it, that they, they were racist comments and they were unacceptable and wrong. And he made that very clear. Both his spokesman made it very clear uh, and he himself made it very clear in the House of Commons on Wednesday. I was there, I heard him. He was very robust and clear about but it. You know, Mark Harper, that some of your colleagues did mm. think it took too long and they did think there was too much of a delay because things happen very fast in politics. And what was interesting, and we had a very strong response from many of our viewers this week, it was clear straight away. I can give you some of their comments. Clive Phillips said the alleged statement was to most of the population obviously racist and misogynistic. Another viewer said they were horrible, hurtful, insensitive and, ra insensitive and racist. Another said Chris Battle said they were clearly racist and sexist. Why did Downing Street not straight away agree with our viewers' description of these comments? Well, look, we, we did agree with those um, those descriptions. The Prime Minister was very clear about it. Look, I think you do want to just go and check your facts. You know, just because a newspaper reports something, you want to just go and check your facts, but we were very clear about it. Uh, they were racist comments. Mr Hester apologised for those comments, um, and, we, and we said we should accept his apology, which we've done. But what facts were to check? Because Downing Street was very happy to say these were rude, unacceptable, unpleasant mm -hmm. comments. So nobody was denying, Downing Street was not mm -hmm. denying at that point that this had taken place. It was their description of what those words well, meant. The, and forgive me for laboring yeah, yeah, yeah. this point, but this is absolutely vital. Well, look, the Prime Minister was very clear about it, and I, I was there in the House of Commons on Wednesday. He couldn't have been clearer. I mean, having an argument about how many hours it took to say something, I, I don't really think is the issue here. The you issue is... the issue is... Absolutely is the issue. And you can't say that it's not an issue, lol, that it's taken a, some amount of time to actually say those statements, when you correctly made the same criticism of Keir Starmer for taking a certain number of days to remove support for Azar Rally in Rochdale after he said his statements. You can't go after Keir Starmer for being too slow to withdraw support from Azar Rally and then also say, well, it doesn't matter that it took us a whole day to call the comments by Frank Esther racist. Because it's bad for, in both of these situations that both people waited too long. It's bad in both of them. You can't hold a double standard. The Prime Minister was very clear that those were racist comments, they were unacceptable, and he was absolutely clear about it in terms when he was asked about it in the House of Commons on Wednesday. You know, I was there, I heard him uh, make, be very robust about it. Having sent some of your colleagues out to say that they weren't to do with race and they weren't to do with gender, but you've made your point, you think Downing Street had to take its time. The other issue here is the money. So he is, as things stand, your biggest donor. We know he's given £10 million. Pounds. I'll ask you in a second whether he's given more of that. But our viewer Christopher Dunkley wants to know, why are the Tories hanging on to cash from someone Sunak says has made racist comments? Why are you hanging on to the money? Well, look, the Prime Minister was asked about this as well. Look, we, we took a donation um, that was predated his comments, um, and we've declared that in the usual way, which is how people know that he's made that donation. Uh, he's made comments, and he's apologised for them, and the Prime Minister's made it very clear that um, the donation stands. Um, so uh, you, you, know, you don't think, think you should give the money no, back? No, no, I, I, I don't. I, I think he's made comments. They were racist. They were unacceptable. The Prime Minister's... 
actually, the thing is, I'm going to dissent a little bit. And people keep saying, oh, they have, they have to give the money back. They have to donate the money. I mean, I don't really care what they do with the money. Like, the idea that somehow, oh, now the Conservative Party is tainted with racist money when they've been getting donations from plenty of unscrupulous people for the entirety of their existence, right? This is not the only dirty money they've received. This is not the only donation that's tainted by having been donated by somebody who holds unsavoury beliefs. Like, who really cares whether or not they donate the money or not? I mean, I'm happy for them to get attacked over it. I'm happy for everyone to get attacked by it. Like, at the end of the day, the, my issue is not that there was £10 million donated by a racist. My problem is that someone as rich as Croesus, like Frank Esser, can have such a vice grip over our democracy by being able to very clearly bankroll individually an entire political party's political campaigning. Like, £10 million is a gigantic sum of money. Nobody should have that much leverage over a political party, ever. We should actually change our entire campaign finance rules. Because it's just a, it's, it's, it's a mockery. It's an obscene mockery of democracy that one person can have that much leverage and power. Has made that very clear. Mr. Hester himself, and I think you, you carried that in your piece earlier, uh, has apologised for saying he has, so he and we should make that. He recognises they were wrong as well. But he has not apologised for them accepting that they were racist. He's apologised for making rude remarks. And that also, the specifics of his mm -hmm. apology are also important here. Has he or has he not given the Conservatives another £5 million? Pounds? Well, look, I, we've declared the donation that he's made. Uh, I'm obviously not involved in donations to the party as the Transport Secretary. That's not what I'm involved with. If in the future there's a future donation, that will be declared in the usual way. But that's a hypothetical question that will be looked at. There are processes for looking at donations to political parties and declaring them. Um, I'm not involved with those, but my understanding is if there was a future one, it would be looked at in the usual way and declared. Um, but that is a hypothetical question. Um, you know, well, it's not really a hypothetical, hypothetical It's not really a hypothetical question because there has been reporting this week from reputable organisations saying that he has offered another £5 million to the party. I think our viewers might have expected, with respect, Mark Harper, that you might have found this out before coming well, on our programme today because this has been a matter of huge public interest. Did you not ask well, look, those involved? I'm glad for once, right, on an important issue such as this, Laura Koonsberg has taken somebody who doesn't answer a question in any way satisfactorily by just saying, well, we don't know, maybe something will happen later, but I'm not sure, we'll have to check, and say, well, surely you should know this before you come on. And I agree, she should be skewering them over this. Why does it never happen on economic issues? Why is there never this kind of line taken with Tory MPs when or Labour MPs any representative from any party, when they come on and say things like, well, we, we, we'll make the NHS amazing, or we'll do all of these things for childcare, link about all the levelling up that we're doing, and that they never go, oh, hang on a minute, you know, you're not giving me a proper answer here, don't you think you should have researched this at least a little bit before coming on to talk on the biggest politics programme in the country? About donations that have been made already, those are on the record, that's how people know about them, what happens in the future uh, you know, is a hypothetical question which will be looked at but in But it's not course. really a hypothetical question because there is a clear <coughs> suggestion that's been reported by reputable outlets that he's already given another £5 million to the Conservative Party. And I think for some of our viewers, they might listen to you not being able to tell us a straight answer this morning and think of what the Prime Minister said when he moved into number 10. I just want to listen to this. Tom Harwood says our campaign finance rules are too strict. Well, I mean, Tom Harwood essentially pals around with all the same kind of people who fund PragerU. I believe there is funding crossover between PragerU and Turning Point UK, which is his former employer. And of course, he's now employed by GB News, who runs around in this, that same kind of sphere of right-wing donor class of people. So I'm not surprised that Tom Harwood takes a money in politics, what's the problem attitude towards political campaigning. What's generally ironic and hypocritical about Tom Harwood's position is that he claims to be some kind of libertarian right winger. And yet, what do you think is like the libertarian's first response to when you say that the polit political classes are corrupt? They say, oh, well, it's nothing to do with capitalism. It's crony capitalism. It's crony capitalism. Yet that's, that's what money in politics being a problem is. Literally their own problem with people interfering with the free market by being able to buy off politicians. Like, you see, it's a completely incoherent worldview to say that we have too strict on our campaign finance laws, but also that you need to have less government interference when that's what they're going to do if they get paid off to do it. We'll have integrity, professionalism, and accountability 
at every level. He promised the highest levels of integrity mm -hmm. and accountability. There's been a matter of enormous public interest this week over whether Frank Hester has given mm -hmm. the Conservative Party five million more pounds. Isn't it a contradiction between the promise that Rishi Sunak made to the country about being accountable, about integrity, that you can't tell us what's going on? Well, look, the donations that Mr Hester's made in the past have been properly looked at, they've been accepted and they've been declared in the open and transparent way that we're required to do and you expect us to do. If there are future donations, uh, I don't know whether Mr Hester is going to make any donations and in the future at didn't, all. And you didn't ask anyone are, in the party if whether he was giving more money if there are future, came well, look, I don't know whether he's going to be giving us donations in the future. If he were to do so, we have proper processes for checking that they are acceptable. Well, the thing is, what's interesting here is that it's clear that they're speaking on two completely different wavelengths. Laura is just like, well, you know, right, that you're happy to accept this money and the implicit political leverage, knowing the opinions of the person who's giving you that money. And Mark Harper's just like, but it's just a free business transaction rationally made between two independent actors. Why are you getting involved? Because conservative moral philosophy cannot ever even conceive of the idea that an exchange of finance or money can be done in a morally questionable way. And then they're declared in the usual way. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know whether he's going to be minded to give us more money in the future, but there are proper processes, and then they will be declared in the usual way, as the Prime Minister said, so that they're very transparent and that people can make judgments accordingly. Do the Conservatives have a problem with race? Absolutely yes. not. As the Prime Minister himself said this week, we're a party proudly led by the first British Asian Prime Minister with the most ethnically diverse cabinet there's ever been. Uh, and we're a party which welcomes people from across the United Kingdom, whatever their background. As long as they're rich. Doesn't matter what their background was, as long as they're rich, as long as they support giving money to rich people, and as long as they support continual advancement of the causes of the rich, that's fine. And this, again, is where this liberal identity politics stuff, where they just say, oh, look at all of this representation that we have, all of these different ethnic minorities, even though there's no material justice on the ground for these different ethnic minority groups that they belong to. They will happily weaponize ethnic minority groups when you look at the comments being made by Swella Bravman and things like that. All of the internal racism, they don't call out until it becomes politically unfeasible for them. And on top of that, you do not mention class ever. That's why in the intersection analysis, class is part of the intersection. And there's a reason why, when you look at a bunch of the ethnic minority people who are at the top of the party, oh look, they're all people who went to private school, have incredibly rich parents and have very lucrative careers. That's it, right? Whereas class will not protect you from racism, as we know already, as we've seen plenty of times, it also means that you can suddenly believe somehow that because you are part of a higher class you're not going to be subject to those same kind of racisms as well and therefore will be insulated from it at least somewhat if not but not entirely obviously which is why the intersections of both class and race has to be important in all of these kind of discussions to understand who's going to be the victims and whose material interests lie in which ends whatever their race uh, if they share our values and our approach to politics we want everyone to be a member of the conservative party and feel very comfortable within it but some of them are not the Tory peer Baroness Farsi, for example, has warned that it could be dangerous to take money from this man. If the former Home Secretary Sadiq Javid said there's a, a real problem with social cohesion this morning and that politicians must do much more to address it, he's even suggesting having a department of, of citizenship to combat this problem. And yet you're saying this morning there isn't a problem. Well, look, I think the Prime Minister made it very clear this week in the House of Commons. Look, he, he leads a government which has got a very diverse cabinet. He's the first British Asian Prime Minister. And actually, something that Samuel said I think was very important was that he's the first British Asian Prime Minister, when he became the first British Asian Prime Minister, it wasn't a big deal. And I, think I mean, that is true. It wasn't a big deal when he became Prime Minister because we knew it was just a posh twat, like all the other posh twats within the posh twat party. Like, who gives a shit whether or not he's brown or not? But it is interesting that you become the, the UK's first British Asian Prime Minister and then immediately can use his platform to be able to denigrate other Asians trying to get into the country as if there was some kind of invasion or whatever protecting Swallow Bravman using that explicit rhetoric. I think that is quite important, actually. That wasn't the most important thing about him being Prime Minister. I think that says a lot about our country, uh, and I think the Conservative Party should be proud that we've broken a lot of those barriers about those first. Okay. And I think that's a very strong message to people from... I mean, the thing as well is, I think it's good, I mean, I will always say it's good that we have this representation now. It's certainly not a utilitarian bad that these people are here, right? It does say something about the country that it wasn't necessarily a big deal for a lot of people. And I think Mark Harper is right about that, that our attitude towards race in this country has usually been pretty positive in recent years, even if there are, you know, some, some bad things happening behind the scenes, in especially in the upper echelons of society, right? The Frank Hesters of this world. But they're in a minority, which I think is fine. 
The issue, of course, comes that if Labour were to do the same thing, when you say, oh, Labour haven't had you know, a black person or a woman or an Asian person leading their party, the response always comes, well, if Labour would do it, it would be woke, right? For some reason, the Conservatives get away with virtue signalling. They get away with tokenization. They get away with liberal and poll garbage because people don't expect it from them. So it, it's a novelty. Because if Labour were to do it, they would be accused of pandering in the way that the Conservatives aren't, which is a real kind of double standard. Because at the end of the day, it just, people should be far more normal about this, to say representation is good, but it's not everything. Real, actual emancipatory politics and real material benefits to those groups and obviously along class lines as well is actually what's important here. And I think it just shows just how much class is going to be the big defining material group in terms of political allegiance now that we see all of the ethnic minority representation within the upper class party, between the party of the bourgeois, very specifically. Back to politics. Earlier we talked to the Conservative Cabinet Minister Mark Harper about the attack on Diane Abbott. He said the, she said too the actions of the Labour leadership had also been disappointing. Ms Abbott was suspended by Labour last April after writing that Irish, Jewish and traveller people were not subject to racism all their lives. But nearly a year on, she's still waiting to find out whether she'll be allowed back into the party. Well, Labour's Jonathan Ashworth is here. Welcome. Good to have you here with us in the studio. Harriet Harman has told us this morning. Angela Rayner, Deputy Leader, the Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper, they've all said they would like to see Diane Abbott sitting again as a Labour MP. Would you? Well, first of all, can I say I can't imagine what Diane has been through this week. I think it is. What about what she was going through throughout the period of 2015 to 2019? What about when you can't use it as a political attack or indeed as a way of piggybacking off her for fundraising? What about all of those times where she was crying in the toilets because of things that people in Labour Party HQ were saying about her? Huh? Do you want to mention that at all? No, 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 no. We'll just use what is politically convenient for you, shall we, John? Well documented that Diane is the Member of Parliament who gets the most abuse. For her to open the newspapers this week and not only read this reprehensible, racist, disgusting comments about her, but to read that somebody was talking about how she should be shot. This is in the context of two of our parliamentary mm -hmm. colleagues being murdered in recent years. And then to see that Tories take so long to even acknowledge the racism and still refuse to hand back the £10 million which is mm. bankrolling their party. I think that shows you the depths to which the Tory party is sunk to. On the particular issue, and I'm afraid I probably am going to frustrate you here in, in this interview, there is an independent process that looks into these matters. I can't second guess that process. I did in a, I, I have in the past served on Labour's National Executive Committee, so I understand mm. these processes have to be free from political interference. But my question was, Jonathan Ashworth, would you like to see her back as a Labour MP? Uh, uh, D Diane is a good colleague and... They keep talking about the independent process, but again, it's already been leaked to the press, very specifically, that they tried to railroad her into standing down at the next election in return for having the whip restored. So it's not even necessarily independent, which again was something that was recommended to them in the Ford report, that thing that apparently never happened in terms of the press. They never mention it, they never talk about it, even though it blows us wide open. We'll watch that a bit later with the interview between Martin Ford and Sankey Tamiska on, on LBC. But they never mention the, the Ford report. It would almost be like they didn't want to mention the Ford report. Because if they did mention the Ford report, they would then also have to acknowledge that they didn't contact Martin Ford KC after that report was published. Nobody at all from Labour HQ got in contact with him. And that Martin Ford himself specifically thinks that their work that they've done on tackling anti-black and anti-Muslim bigotry within the party has been not sufficient in his own level, in his own words. Watch Al Jazeera's Labour Files Part 4 where he speaks to them very specifically about what they think is the failures of Labour's complaints procedure. I have the, um, um, uh, I am in awe of everything she has achieved over many years. So would you like to see but her But I'm not the going to pressure the independent process. It's important these processes take their course. And the reason, I am not casually indifferent to what has gone on, not just this week, but the abuse that Diane has had over and, many, and many years. the Labour but, but Party it's, itself but, has racism within its ranks. And, and we must not be complacent about racism. We must challenge it. We must challenge Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. If, if we see that in the Labour Party, as we do when we see it in society at large. But the point I'm making is if you have a, <clears throat> an independent process, that is important, mm -hmm. not just for this particular case, mm -hmm. but for every other case this independent process but, looks at. And our viewers... Okay, so th let's have a look at some other cases, shall we, huh? Let's take a look at some other cases. How we about we have to look into Neil Coyle, shall we? A man who was suspended for racially abusing somebody. 
I believe it was a journalist, took it four or five months back in the party again. You look at, was it Rupert Huck who made racist comments about Quasi Kwarteng? Four months back in the party, both from the Labour right. You look at what was Barry Shearman who said specifically, was it, about a run on shekels? Yet he didn't even get suspended. Neither did Steve Reid after he apologised for calling a Jewish man a puppet master. You know, when it comes to Dan Abbott, 11 months on, they're still running the clock down, hoping for a snap election so that she gets replaced while she's suspended. That's it. That's obviously what's going on. It's weird how this independent procedure takes so long in the case of Diane Abbott when their mates in the party have their claims expedited in comparison. Hmm. Very strange, isn't it? Chris will understand what you've said there about having people that look at this specifically. But what many people might find almost bewildering is the letter that she published that was in the Observer newspaper was 126 words long. Mm. Today, it's 330 days since it was published. She apologised almost immediately. How on earth has it taken so long? And it's important also for our viewers to understand in other cases, there was Rupa Huck, another Labour MP, who called Kwasi Kwarteng superficially black, then apologised. She was allowed back within five months. An investigation to another colleague of yours, Andy MacDonald, that was just under five months. Well, to be, let's be real, there should never have been an investigation over Andy MacDonald because she never should have been suspended because his comments were literally completely unoffensive. And in fact, laudable, laudable words by him when he had, he had the whip suspended over nothing. The fact that he even had to go through the process is quite frankly insulting to anybody's intelligence because he's from the left of the party, so there's no quarter given to him whatsoever. Yet the absolutely horrendous stuff that Neil Coyle's done, fine, just let him back in, not a problem. In this case, why has it taken nearly a year to look at what Diane Abbott said in a 126-word letter. Well, I mean, I said a few moments ago, I am going to frustrate you in this interview because you're asking me questions which I, quite properly, do not know the answer to. Because if it's an independent process, it's, they're not going to be telling me as a politician the ins and outs of what is going on in every step of the way. So I understand the frustration. I can, I can well imagine there are viewers very frustrated going, oh, there's a typical politician not answering the question on all that. But the simple truth is, if you have an independent process, I don't get reports on it. That, has, that process has to be allowed to look into all the matters without political pressure, as it does for every other case that is brought before it. But do you find it frustrating? Do you find it frustrating having to answer questions about something that has dragged on for so long? Well, so remember, this is down up at Lake or HQ that do these. These are the same people who said things like, Diane Abbott literally makes me sick. These are the kind of things that were said about her by the Labour officials who are in the current place, the current part of the bureaucracy that is going to be dealing with this kind of thing. Come on. I can well understand why people want answers to this. Of course I can. I'm, of course I can. I'm not a, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not daft. Of course we want to see an answers to this. And you're right. I mean, I want to be talking about, you know, the upcoming general election, the Tory I'm, leadership we'll election, and all of that sort of stuff, and Labour's plan to rebuild the country. Of course I do. But I, I, I do want to come back to this problem. And, and the reason I say this in, and, and I. And I, I hope people, the viewers don't think I'm coming across as overly of, of, official in my response. Is that I've been a member of the Labour NEC. Mm -hmm. I know That's how the these things. Governing committee of the party. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I know how these things work. I know how solicitors can sometimes get involved, uh, and that what people say on programmes like this can be used in the debates and in the discussions that go on when it's supposed to be an independent process. And okay, can you guarantee that it will conclude before the general election? Well, I mean, I would I would hope so, and I would thought I would hope that parliamentary colleagues. Um, all of whom are involved in a complaint being investigated. I would hope that all of these things get concluded in a timely manner. Okay. One of the big things that we talked about in the last... And also the, the, the incredible part of all of this, right, the best part about all of this is that when we had all of the WhatsApps, which involved a bunch of the attempts to undermine the Corbyn team, including Dan Abbott, including a bunch of the comments. Guess who was one of the people who was the ringleaders within this specific WhatsApp group? I don't know whether she made the specific claims in nature, but as Emily Oldnown, Jonathan Ashworth's lover, she was one of the people who was in these groups trying to conspire against the leadership from 2015 to 2019. So the goal of him to sit down here and talk about, oh, Dan Abbott's a trailblazer. Like, come on, mate, come on. Hey there, if you enjoyed the video, make sure that you like and leave a comment that helps the video out in the algorithm. If you subscribe and ring the bell, it'll let you know when I go live. I stream every day on YouTube and Twitch. You can also follow all of my socials down in the description. And if you want to support me in a more financial manner, there's a join button for membership to just 99p to be a member on YouTube, as well as a patron. And there's some merch there as well. And hopefully I'll catch you on the next video. Take care.